Thank you, Winnie and Eileen and the worship team um, for setting the scene for us this morning. And from my side, a huge welcome. Uh, it's great to be able to gather together as God's people, and today especially as we welcome into God's family, recognizing that God loves each and every single one of us, one of the newest members of our congregation. And let's pray. God, our Creator, our thoughts cannot contain you. Our words fall short of your vastness. Yet, you are our God, God of all ages. Your breath gives us life. Your hands shape our being. Your artistry in creation leaves us gasping in wonder, longing to experience that which is of you. In each person, there you are. If we could but discern you, accept our praise, O God, as we gather to worship and adore you. As we come before you, Lord, we thank you that when we need proof of you in the world, you offer your breath. When we hold too tight to the past, you offer us your grace. When we cling to old hurts, you offer your compassion. When we use our words and actions to wound others, you offer your healing. When we fail to forgive those who have hurt us, you offer your hope. When we hurt others with or without intention, you offer your peace. When we separate ourselves from you, you offer your forgiveness, redeeming Christ. You bring us back to you. You make possible the impossible. It is through your love and forgiveness that we find healing and freedom. Thank you that you forgive our sin, set us free to live as your children of light and life. And may your light shine through us to bring life to others. In Jesus' name we pray, as we say together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, it's always a great privilege and an honor to be able to baptize little children. Um, especially when they are so helpless that they still need all our attention. Um, And they need a lot of attention, don't they? Um, Especially at certain ages, but it doesn't really change that much. Am I right? Um, But it, it, it reminds me when we hold a helpless babe and baptize them into the family of God, that all are welcome into God's family. We are not welcome because of who we are. We're not welcome because of what we can do or how much we know and understand. We're welcome because God loves us and accepts us just as we are. And so baptizing little children always reminds me of that. The words for our uh, liturgy are going to come up on the overhead. And I invite you to respond where indicated Um, as I lead us. And so, family in Christ, baptism is a gift of God. It declares to each one of us the love and the grace of God. In this sacrament, we celebrate the life of Christ laid down for us, the Holy Spirit poured out on us, and the living water offered to us. God claims us and cleanses us, rescues us from sin, and raises us to new life. God plants us into the church of Christ, 
and sustains and strengthens us with the power of the Spirit. Although we do not deserve these gifts of grace or fully understand them, God offers them to all and through Christ invites us to respond. And so we recall the words of the risen Christ who said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the gospel of Christ's resurrection. Those who heard the message asked what they should do. And Peter told them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. And so I invite the parents uh, to bring the child to be baptized, and if the sponsors or godparents would join them at the rail as we prepare to baptize this child. So I ask the parents, and your response is up on the overhead, it's not an exam, Uh, But uh, your your responses are there. And so I ask you, having heard these things, how do you respond to the offer of God's grace? Do you turn away from evil and all that denies God? Do you turn to God, trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, and in the Holy Spirit as Helper and Guide? So let's all together confirm our common faith as we say together, we believe in God the Creator who made the world. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, who redeemed humankind. We believe in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God. And so I ask you, what name have you given to this child? Eliana. Eliana, are you going to come to me? You look very, very fragile, and I'm not used to such teeny tiny little babies anymore, Eliana. But Eliana, oh thank you. Eliana, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. By God's grace, you are welcomed into the family of God. And so I sign you with the sign of the cross, the sign of God's presence amongst us. Friends, this is Eliana. You can't really see her all that well, but this is the newest member of our family. Ooh, and I'm going to give her back because she's about to cry. <laughs> there we go. So, Winnie, I invite you to give the family a lighted candle as a sign of God's light that is passed on to each one of us.
to God's grace and love by making the following promises. And again, it will be up on the overhead. So to the parents I asked, will you give yourselves unstintingly to making your life an environment of love and honesty, whereby your example, your children will feel safe and accepted? Will you spend time with your children, encouraging them to explore their spirituality, to gain an honest knowledge of Jesus, and to be challenged to apply His teachings in their lives? And will you do what you can to make the church a place that you would like your children to attend? And then to the godparents or sponsors who joined, I ask you, Will you take seriously your task in helping these parents in the Christian upbringing of their children? Then as a congregation, I invite us to stand as we commit ourselves to, to continue to nurture all the children, but especially this newest member. And so I ask you, members of the body of Christ, we rejoice that this child has been baptized as a member of our family in Christ. I ask you, will you love and prayerfully accept these parents and this child into the family of God? Will you support them and encourage them in the task of Christian parenthood? And will you help maintain the church and all its ministries in such a way that all children among us may come to discover for themselves who Jesus is, and how they can live for Him and serve Him best. Thank you. Let's pray. Generous God, touch us all again with the fire of Your Spirit, and renew in us all the grace of our baptism, that we may profess the one true faith and live in love and unity with all who are baptized into Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We turn now to our scripture readings for this morning. And our first reading um, uh, is not going to come up on the overhead because the, the version that I'm going to read, and I suppose I could have sent it through to Auntie Winnie, but it's fine. The version I, that I'm going to read from is a version that I've um, put together myself from various different versions um, that I believe captures the essence of a psalm that is often very familiar to us, and therefore sometimes we, I think, miss the, the truths that it contains. And it's Psalm 23, and it reads as follows. The Lord is my shepherd. I will never be in need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He refreshes my life. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff comfort me. You treat me to a feast while my enemies watch. You welcome me as an honored guest and you fill my cup until it overflows. Your goodness and love Chase after me every day of my life, and your house will be my home forever. And then we turn to John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, and this will be up on the overhead. Just have to check, is this thing still recording? Good. Please keep an eye on it. I'm glad the young people are in the front here, because my phone has a habit of just like stopping the recording in the middle of everything. So if it does, just start, just press record again. Okay. And so John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. Uh, the man who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who goes in through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice as he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
When he has brought them out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. They will not follow someone else. Instead, they will run away from such a person, because they do not know his voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he meant. And so Jesus said again, I am telling you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All others who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever comes in by me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life, life in all its fullness. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Friends, we live in a world where um, especially, I think, the younger generation um, are, are kind of chasing after followers. Instagram followers. How many followers do we have on Instagram? How many followers do, followers do we have on Twitter? Um, for those slightly older, um, how, how many um, friends do we have on Facebook? Uh, how many followers do we have on TikTok? And, and kind of especially for the younger folk, the more followers you have, the more you kind of you are, you are seen to have arrived. And so those who have the, the most followers seem to be the ones that society holds up as those who have arrived. And so there's a lot of focus on followers. As early Christians tried to make sense of the risen Christ and what it meant for their lives, one of the images they, re they recalled was Jesus saying what we've just read, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And in the original language that, that was written in, that word translated good can also be translated and holds the meaning of beautiful, excellent, honest, honorable. Beautiful, excellent, honest, honorable. And we are invited to follow the good shepherd. Now I wonder how many of those that we do follow are honest and honorable. I wonder how many of those that demand that we follow them are honest and honorable. But we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. He loves us, he knows us, and he cares for us. He laid down his life for us. He's not just some hired hand who's going to run away when things get tough, when the going gets tough. But he is fully committed to us as his followers. He laid down his life for us. Now that is the kind of leader worth following. A leader who's willing to follow through on their promises. A leader who goes all the way, even to the point of death, giving his own life. And then who comes back from death with great life and shows love and forgiveness before taking his place of honor and glory and power. Jesus is the one who leads us to quiet waters and green fields, to that which is best for us. Sometimes we may wander off to the fields that are not so good for us, but Jesus guides us to that which gives us life. He is the good shepherd who protects us from danger. 
Uh, I know that there are often images of Jesus, the good shepherd. Um, and Jesus, the, the pictures that we see are usually of Jesus, the good shepherd, holding a, a, a tiny little, little lamb. Um, and and, and the, the, that Jesus always looks um, clean and, you know, and, and kind of not rough and ready. Uh, and so I think the image that we have of Jesus, the good shepherd, is, is of one who is kind of meek and mild, maybe. But the reality of shepherds, particularly in those days, was that they were not soft and fluffy. <laughs> they were strong. They had to protect their, their flock from danger. And... And so the reality of the sh of shepherds in that time would have been that they would be dirty, smelly, rough, dangerous, strong, hard. Because shepherds at that time lived with the sheep. They didn't simply go home at night and clean themselves up. They were fully committed to the sheep. And so they were often seen as, as out costs from society because they spent so much time with the sheep. The shepherd literally slept in the gateway. The, the, the sheep, um, places where the sheep slept in those days were usually low stone walls in a kind of circle with a little gap. So there was no real gate that you could open or close. And the shepherd at night after herding the, um, the, the sheep into the, the shelter would, would then lie in front of the, in, in that gap. So that the shepherd was the first to, to receive any danger and was always there to, to help. The, the shepherd, we're told, led the sheep. Not drove the sheep from behind with a whip, like sometimes we picture, but led the sheep, walked with the sheep. This is a picture of, of one who is with us, not one who watches from a distance. The shepherd protected the sheep from wild animals and often would lose their lives. You're, we may be reminded, for example, of David, who, when he was uh, um, discovered as the one who would be the great king that he was, was a shepherd looking after the sheep. And he was toughened by being a shepherd. When Goliath and the Philistines come and confront the army of Israel, and Goliath especially mocks and, and says to, to them, uh, you know, who are you going to send against me? And of course, Saul wants to put all his armor onto to David. And David said, I can't, I can't deal with that. I've, I've, fought, I've fought wild animals with just my bare hands and my slingshot. I can deal with this oak. <laughs> and he does. He deals with Goliath decisively. That's the kind of tough image of a, of a uh, shepherd that we have. And the shepherd cared for each one personally. Jesus told a story about a shepherd who, who looked after a hundred sheep and one sheep went missing. And the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes off in search of that one. Each one is loved personally. When we go through tough times, the good shepherd is with us. He doesn't leave when the going gets tough. And note that in the Psalm 23 that we read, the shepherd doesn't save us from the valleys of the shadow of death, the dark valleys, the dangerous valleys, but says that when we pass through those valleys, he is with us. 
And in those valleys, we are told, his rod and his staff protect us. Even when we have nothing, God is with us. And so we shall not want and we shall never be in need because God is with us wherever we may find ourselves. And, and as for those of us who follow, what are the implications for us? Well, firstly, we need to get to know the voice of the shepherd. He knows us. He knows each one of the sheep intimately. But how well do we know him? In verse 27 we didn't read this a bit later on in that passage. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I know them and they follow me. And they listen to my voice. I once read about somebody who was in um, the Middle East um, re more, more recently, not way back then. And was out in the fields and saw uh, a whole bunch of sheep. And the shepherds were sitting watching strategically. And then it came time obviously to move the sheep. And each of the shepherds stood up and, and whistled. A unique whistle. And the sheep divided themselves up and went to their own shepherd the, the, they knew the whistle or the voice of the shepherd we think sheep are are dumb animals but they're not so dumb and they know the voice of the shepherd they go where they know they will receive life there are lots of voices clamoring for our attention how do we tell the difference between the voices, the voice of, of the good shepherd and the voices of those who just want to do us harm? If you really know someone, you'll recognize their voice, even in the midst of a whole bunch of other voices or noise. Ask a mother with a baby. Hey? You can be in, in a place where there's lots of, of babies, but your baby cries and you know that's my baby. Because we know the voice of, of, of those that we, that we love. But when it comes to the good shepherd, I know it's difficult at times. And so we must get to know the voice of Jesus. And I guess the best way to do that is to study Scripture. Jesus speaks about the fact that all Scripture points to Jesus. But spending time with the specific Scriptures about Jesus may help us to recognize His voice. But there's another way that we can, that we can tell if it's Jesus' voice or if it's a voice of someone else that we maybe shouldn't follow. And, and that, I believe, the key to that is in John 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life. Life in all its fullness. The way that we can tell if it's Jesus' voice or the voice of the thief is Jesus' voice always leads to life. Jesus' voice leads to life. There are many voices that lead to death, destruction, and deceit. What voices are you listening to? What voices are you listening for? What voices are guiding your life at the moment? 
Where is your life headed? Are you experiencing life in all its fullness? Or are you experiencing death, destruction and deceit in your own life? There are many things that rob us of life. But Jesus wants us to experience fullness of life. He gave his life so we might have life in all its fullness. Life of the eternal that begins here and now and continues forever. Resurrection life. What voices are leading you away from life to death or deceit? Maybe the voice that calls you a loser, a failure, tells you you're too fat or too thin, tells you you're not good enough, that tells you you need to always be busy in order to have life. And that just robs you of life. A commentator that I found read, said the following, among the thieves and bandits who might lead us astray are those who try to convince us that we're not good enough to be a part of Jesus' flock. Sometimes such thieves and bandits are self-righteous people of faith who look down on us because we don't meet their standards for true believers. Sometimes authority figures such as parents and teachers crush our sense of self-worth. And some of us have done really bad things. No matter how often we hear that God forgives us, we can't forgive ourselves. And in effect, decide that God's love for sinners doesn't apply to us. But in this passage, the commentator goes on to say, Jesus says it's not the quality of the sheep, but rather the inclusiveness of the shepherd that decides who's in the flock. Verse 9, it says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Later in the chapter, Jesus' inclusiveness is underscored when he says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Even if we feel we don't belong to Jesus, Jesus reaches out to us. And promises inclusion. Walter Brueggemann said, The world believes that we are finally in the grip of death. We spend our frightened energy trying to stay young and be healthy. We use our money to secure our existence. We work frantically to establish our worth. We're propelled by fear that evokes violence and produces policies of aggression and militarism. Against that, Jesus offers a way of eternal life that puts us out of the reach of deathliness. By eternal life, the church means the full and final establishment of our worth, our identity, and our destiny. In God's rule. What is robbing you of life? Jesus' voice leads to life in all its fullness. The others lead to deceit and death. In conclusion, we need to remember that we are part of a flock. We are not meant to be alone. And it's not a flock that we choose. Jesus chooses who's a part of this flock. If, if God loves me, God loves them. And therefore I need to learn to love them too. We like to choose who's good enough, who's worthy 
that we are worthy only because God makes us worthy, part of his flock, owned by him. Later on, in verse 16, as I said, he said, there's room for others. There's room for more. And he wants them all in. We need to learn to make room for those who are not here, who are not part of the family yet. The work of gathering, deciding who's good enough belongs to God, not to us. We are simply to provide a space where all are welcome. God knows us and still loves us. God seeks the one that is lost. What makes us more worthy than them? You become like the one you follow. Being a follower of Christ will make us people who care for others as much as Christ does. Make us one who seeks the very best for others, not because they deserve it, but because God's love compels us. Jesus offers life now for us, for others. Follow him. I want to close by reading that psalm again. The Lord is my shepherd. I will never be in need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He refreshes my life. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff comfort me. You treat me to a feast while my enemies watch. You welcome me as an honored guest and you fill my cup until it overflows. Your goodness and love chase after me every day of my life. And your house will be my home forever. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, who moves within and among us, around us and ahead of us, we thank you for the fellowship we have in you. You are the bond between us who breathes into the life of our community, that perfect unity of love that is one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Inspire us, we humbly pray, that in the life that we share together as a community of faith, people may know themselves loved as Jesus loves. May we be communities of reconciliation, seeking restorative justice, building bridges, making connections, reaching out to others to the glory of your holy name. We pray especially for people in challenging places, in countries recovering from earthquake or other natural disasters, in places where there's war, in situations where people have been hurt by the actions of others and where relationships are fractured. God of peace, may the love with which the good shepherd tends all the flock restore the image of God in us all. Gracious God, after whom every family on earth and heaven takes its name, we thank you for the deep relationships, for opportunities to give and to receive, to listen and hear what another is saying, to serve one another and celebrate every kindness. In a moment of silence now, we bring to you all the people, places and situations that need to experience your life-giving spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for all whose office and responsibilities affect the lives of many, for those who represent their country's interests. We pray that in all they do, they may be mindful of the well-being of every child of God. Jesus, crucified, risen, and ascended Lord, you intercede for us before the throne of God. Thanks be to you. 
Holy Spirit, you help us to pray in sounds too, wor- too deep for words. Thanks be to you. Creator of life, you call us to life anew. Thanks be to you. These prayers we offer to the one in whom we live and move and have our being, to whom be all glory and praise. Amen. And so we say together the benediction as we bless one another. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.